midst of call-out culture, modern authors have become subject to proliferating prohibitions regarding the content of their fictional works, with one of the primary justifications for this censorship being that writers do not have the authority to represent perspectives that are not theirs. Does the battle between insensitivity and oversensitivity in the realm of fiction invite a greater attitude of ignorance and division by promoting the idea that we can never aptly empathise with a world that is not a mirror image of our own? Yeah, Lionel, this effectively is a subject of your speech tomorrow night. Yes. Go ahead and, and uh, anticipate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I, I have been very public on this point. Um, Fiction writers, their whole job is to try to imagine being different people. And therefore, to say that you, you are not allowed to project yourself into the minds of characters who have a different uh, race or uh, gender or uh, sexual preference than your own is um, it's not only limiting for the author, it's also... Uh, means that the, the the fiction is going to be very narrow, and you know it's, it creates a kind of weird literary apartheid between two covers. Uh, it's antithetical to the whole nature of uh, the purpose of fiction, which, uh, aside from just to entertain, is also to to enlighten, to invite the reader into new worlds, into new experience, and I generally just unhappy with this whole attitude of, you know, the ownership of your culture and the protection of your your experience and a kind of um, possessiveness about it. I, you know, none of us have very long on this earth and, you know, we need to share with each other as much as possible and that includes imaginatively projecting ourselves into each other's experience, whether that, that is as a reader or, or as a writer. Well, can I ask you, uh, where do you see the threat coming um, when you talk about this? I mean, uh, only yesterday, ahead of your speech, you warned about the dangers of cultural cowardice, uh, a fascistic movement bent on control and silence and obedience. I mean, what is that movement? Where is it coming from? The weird thing about, I mean, a lot of it's coming from universities, but it's certainly spread into the mainstream culture. And I think that uh, one of the biggest problems is, is self-censorship. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are absorbing these made-up rules as if they are ironclad and have to be obeyed. Where are, they, where are the rules coming from, though? That's my point. It's something of a mystery. Mm. They seem to be um, emanating from universities, but also kind of sprouting up on social media. And I think the real problem is, uh, is letting people who invent these rules uh, dictate things. You don't have to take these rules seriously. They're not written in law, right? So ultimately, they're just suggestions that you can ignore. And I, I think it's important uh, to break down the barriers between people and cultures. After all, we've been uh, celebrating multiculturalism, multiculturalism for decades. Mm -hmm. So th this is really antithetical to that, uh, that movement, which was ultimately very productive. You know, it's, it's about a commingling rather than a separation. And that's my biggest problem with identity politics, is the way that it, it divides people and, and separates people from each other and often pits groups of people against each other. So, uh, just before I move on to the other panellists, and I will um, pretty quickly, but, but you seem to be saying, be saying that the logical conclusion of this is the end of fiction, the end of the novel, um, and that all that would be available to a writer is memoir. Well, absolutely, because, uh, I mean, uh, the groups that we're broken into seem to be getting narrower and narrower, and uh, uh, eventually, you know, if you take this to a logical conclusion, um, if I am not allowed to, say, write from a man's perspective or from a, an Australian's perspective, because I'm not Australian, eventually, you know, you narrow it down, then I'm, I'm just writing about five-foot-two American women who were born in North Carolina. <laughs> Benjamin Law, uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, so you, you've uh, you've written um, characters, you've written uh, uh, characters for your, fa your own family mm. uh, in the family law for television, but there are also characters who are not uh, Chinese Australian. Sure, absolutely. Um, I've written characters who 
um, you know, a white middle class women. That's not necessarily my experience. And I think I, I, on, on a, the very core of what you're saying, mm -hmm. I fundamentally agree with. It's not just the craft of a writer, mm -hmm. but also the obligation of a writer, especially a fiction writer, to extend that muscle of empathy, which is why we turn to fiction. We not only just turn to fiction to see <laughs> lives that aren't like ours, um, but lives that we can reflect ourselves in, even though we've got nothing in common with them to share that humanity. That said, I have to say that part of this conversation needs to be contextualised as well because I, I, I'm guessing that um, part of what has galvanised you is hearing things like Lionel Shriver's speech at the Brisbane Writers' Festival perhaps um, and that speech was a really interesting one um, and I have to also declare up front, I'm, I'm a fan of a lot of Lionel's work, um, especially essays. We Need to Talk About Kevin is a really powerful piece of work. But the, Don't the, keep talking. The, <laughs> the, the, the speech itself, though, was interesting because, in part, not wholly, it was res in a response to a Washington Post review to, to one of your novels. And that review wasn't necessarily about cultural appropriation. That reviewer felt that you had uh, written a character poorly, you, a, a character of colour. You know, one of the, one of the um, reasons I resorted to that um, was just to fill out the speech. <laughs> um, and, and let me explain. Uh, there were very few examples at that time, this was in 2016, of the cultural appropriation taboo being applied to fiction. And one of the things that's very interesting to me coming back here three years later is how broadly it has been applied to fiction in the years since. So I was just basically desperate for <laughs> some kind of example. The, the cultural appropriation conversation is an important one, though, because I think it was separate in, in terms of the response of what the Washington Post was pointing about, out in your work. Mm. The whole conversation about cultural appropriation exists because it acknowledges that there's been a long history in performance, in television, in literature, basically across the arts, where people have been spoken about but not engaged in the work, where people have been marginalised within publishing, on the stage, in playwriting, and instead felt their work, had their stories represented by other people. Um, and that is kind of a form of historical erasure and dehumanising. So I, I'm not of the camp where I say you shouldn't write about people mm -hmm. who aren't you. What I am saying is that we need to be cognizant of the history. Uh, we need to be cognizant of racist tropes of blackface, of yellowface, of minstrel shows, because that was the very kind of original sins that spurred this conversation in the okay, first then. place. And, and, and I'm, there's I'm, an opportunity. I, 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 but I need to throw around to the rest of the panel. And uh, let's hear from DeRay, uh, first of all. Uh, listen to this. I mean, I actually went back and had a look at a, a Toni Morrison interview recently, and you know, sadly departed Nobel Prize winner. And she said, I can write about white people. White people can write about black people. Anything can happen in a novel. There are no boundaries there. Um, do you agree with that general proposition? And I think Tony is an incredible artist, and it is sad that she is gone. Uh, I think that the spirit of that is right. And I think that what Ben said is true, is that we are reminding people that the history of publishing is white people telling stories about everybody. That is what publishing was for so long. And it was white authors saying that they were the most authoritative and the most able to write about everybody's culture. And I think that this response now is saying, you know what, people are smart enough to write about themselves, that we trust people to write their own narratives and their own stories, and that we want to empower people to write not only understanding identity as an intellectual exercise, like I'm intellectually sort of inhabiting this other experience, but like I know it because I lived it, right? I think that that is like where this thrust comes from. And I do think that there's a difference between appropriation and appreciation. That appropriation is about exploitation. It is about centering your own experience as you inhabit another body or another life. Appreciation is saying, hey, I'm learning in this moment too. I'm like growing and I'm pushing myself as I explore something else, right? And I think that that is sort of the challenge that we see. So when we think about identity politics, even back to you, is that we'd say that all politics is identity politics, that there's no way that you engage in what power looks like without thinking about yourself as a man, 
or somebody who has a range of identities, that that is like actually what it is, that when we hear people criticize identity politics, what we hear is sort of a dog whistle and a command. We hear people saying that like, it's not that identity doesn't matter, but it's that any identity that's not mine doesn't matter. That is what we hear when we hear that phrase. Because there's no way that you do not enter into conversations mindful of the way that like your lived experiences factor into the world around you. Yeah, that's interesting because, uh, in fact, what Toni Morrison said, what made her really mad was when critics said, oh, you should stop just writing about black people. Right. You should write about white people too. And, in fact, you should write about the confrontation between black and white people. That's the real subject you should be writing about. It made her really mad well, because she wanted to write about her lived experience. And what Toni says too in other writings is she's like, I'm, she's like, black people are the best people to write about white people because we had to survive all of them, right? That, like, that is... <laughs> Tony, Tony is like, we had to raise your kids, we fought we like built the country we did all of it so we are able at, we are more able to write about all of you because we had to survive right yeah. like that is sort of Tony's experience too and I think that there is something to that again that like there are writers who can inhabit other lives as an intellectual experience but at a point I don't want you to write about a gay black man as an intellectual experience I want to hear somebody who lived it write this story and this isn't to say that other people cannot but it is about acknowledging that legacy that it is only white authors who feel the authority to write about everybody else's culture as if they are the voice. I'm just going to quickly go back to Lionel just to respond to that. Um, what, do you, what do you think? That's a, that's a fair point, isn't it? I think it's important to distinguish uh, the cultural appropriation conversation from the diversity one, and, and that is uh, little by little publishing has become more inclusive and has uh, broadened both the audience and the, the authors that, that it promotes, and that's all to the good, that everyone benefits from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and therefore we don't we don't have to defend each other's experience. We can just trade information, and uh, so sometimes this, this this conversation is misinterpreted as as uh, preserving the white privilege to uh, butt into your business. Um, but it's more that I want us all to butt into each other's business, and I am very pleased that publishing is becoming... Well, I've, got, I've, got, I've, I've, I've got to ask you, I've got to ask you, Lana. Privilege in quotes. Privilege is, white privilege is... Uh, it's just a word I'm really yeah. tired of. <laughs> but I've got to ask you... I'm tired um, of racism. Are, you, are, you, are, you, are you so <laughs> provoked? Are you so provoked by the idea that you shouldn't do it, uh, that you're going to put more, uh, let's say, people of colour into your novels? Well, um, my new novel has uh, two uh, secondary black characters and... I'm not sure I did it exactly to defy my critics, but I certainly didn't stop myself, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I included these characters because they were an important part of my story and they needed to be black for a reason. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you what happens. <laughs> uh, but but I d it was interesting having to overcome a little interior reluctance, a little... Uh oh, you're gonna get yourself into trouble. <laughs> because right now, just because of this conversation and, and the sensitivities of the time, any white uh, novelist who includes uh, characters of other races is aware that those characters are going to be subject to super scrutiny. But that's and not necessarily a bad thing. It's not in time. No, of course it isn't. But it it does create. I, I think for a lot of my colleagues, it creates such reluctance that that they may think better of it.